All right, let's, uh, let's get into Matthew chapter 7. I'm glad there's joy of the Lord. And I'll tell you something, I want you to know today that if you're here and you're lost, God, give His Son to die for your sins on the cross. If you have placed, you've repented of your sin, place your faith and trust in His shed blood that He paid for your sins on the cross, and you believe on Him, put your faith and trust in Him, God will save you. And we're not here this morning to dilly-dally with your soul or play game, mind games with you. We're going straight to your heart, straight to your conscience. You must be born again. You're going to die and go to hell if you don't get born again. And that's not some laughing, scoffing matter. So if you're here today and you're lost, we encourage you to, I mean, get saved while you're sitting in your seat. Amen. You don't need, I'll tell you what, if you was a drowning, you could reach out. You could, you could ask, you could ask God for help. If you was in a house fire, you could holler and you could scream for help quick if you needed to. So if you'll ever see yourself as lost and one heartbeat away from hell, you won't, it won't take you long to get saved. It won't take you long. And the Bible said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here today and you're saved, but, uh, you know, you're just not right with God. Man, you ought to get right with God. You know, don't, don't, don't let it come to the point of where God has to chastise you and, uh, and mess things up for a long, long time. Get right with God. Get, be quick about confessing your sin, forsaking your sin. Get serious about it. And then if you're here today and your heart's broke and you're heavy and you're hurting, it's the best place you could be. And I want you to know we love you. And ain't nobody in this church house can really meet your need but Jesus Christ. Amen. And so this morning while I'm preaching, I'm very aware. I've sat under a lot of preaching. A lot of preaching I wasn't even listening to because of things going on in my life. But I'm telling you, God is able to speak to you while I'm hollering and ranting and going on. He's able to speak to your heart. And I, I, all I ask you to do is just listen to him. Listen to him. And I'll tell you what he can do. He can heal your hurts and he can lift your spirit and he can, he can strengthen you for the journey. And he can give you hope and faith in the midst of the darkness of night. He can do it. I'm telling you, he has done it for me thousands and thousands of times. I want you to know I love you this morning. It's hot in here already. Amen. Open them doors and open them wide. Let that air come inside. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 24. The Bible says this. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. I want you to underline the phrase, heareth and doeth. Jesus got through giving you Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. And he covers an unbelievable amount of subjects. He covers the most basic, real issues of life that you're ever going to face in those three short chapters. Someone has said that Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7... It is the constitution of Christianity, and I believe that it is. It is in a nutshell here that everything else you read in the Bible springs out. All the doctrines of Scripture and all the wisdom of God springs out of these chapters. I know and realize that Matthew is specifically written primarily to the Jew. But the Bible, all Scripture is profitable. And so we need to grin hold of it. So here's what I want you to know. The, you will never get nothing out of this whole thing unless you get those two words, hear and do. That's the whole, that's the whole catch line here on this whole thing is hear and do. Because if we've preached through the Sermon on the Mount, went all the way through it. Covered it in other ways through the years. And yet, God says, if you don't hear and do what I've told you, your house is going to fall. Your life's going to crumble. And so I want to say out on the set get-go, don't just listen to preaching this morning. Think about, have I heard, have I really heard the Sermon on the Mount? Have I really put it into action? Have I obeyed it as best I can by the grace of God in each issue that Jesus Christ addressed? Because my message doesn't mean anything to you this morning if you won't personally do that. And this is what he continues saying. He said, those who hear those sayings of mine and doeth them, these past three chapters, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened. He said, if you hear these sayings, but you don't do them. He said, he shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. Isn't it amazing that it's possible for you and I to go to church for 25, 30, 40 years be, be great hearers, but we never honestly do what God said to do. We just 
We just we think it's great. We might intellectually assent to it. We might we might if somebody was ask us, we say that's right, but we've really not done it. Then verse twenty six, he says, and every in verse twenty, he said, he, he, he doeth him not shall be likened unto foolish man build his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. Now what you underline this great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Lord, help us to preach this morning clear and concise, full of the Spirit, Holy Spirit of the living God. I'll tell you, Lord, I, for the first time I ever preached, I couldn't do nothing without you. And it seems like it's worse now. If you don't preach to these people on the inside, there's nothing I can do to help them. Dear God, take thy word this morning. And I pray, preach it deep in the souls and hearts of the people that are here. The needs are many. They're varied. All kinds of situations. God, no way I know them, much less meet them. But you can. I'm asking you to do it. Because your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, you you said you sent your word and healed them. God, help us to be hearers and doers. Of the sayings of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray for his glory. Amen. I want to preach a message on the joy of building on the rock. I I came into this message during this week. I've actually been thinking about this message for four or five weeks. Some of you will notice that I've just kind of jumped out of the Sermon on the Mount and not finished up here with it. But I just wasn't totally at peace with what God was doing with the message. But finally God began to say, Reggie. Why don't you not just preach it from a condemning standpoint? Why don't you preach about the joy of building your life upon the rock? Because oftentimes we make Christianity seem like the hardest thing that ever was, and it's tough and it's rough and it's, oh, it's just such a trial. But I tell you, dear friend, it's a joy to build your life on the rock. It is a joy to build your life on the rock. And in saying that, I'm going to do a lot of reading today because I don't want to get uh, distracted and less by the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to read because I've, I've just wrote the thoughts that, as God brought them to my mind and wrote down a lot. And so I may get turned loose here pretty soon, but I'm going to read quite a bit. Ever since sin came into this world through Adam in the Garden of Eden, since the fall came and sin came upon all of us through Adam, lives, personal lives, homes, marriages, families, and nations have crumbled under the blows and effect of sin. All around us, we see the wreckage continuously. I think as a preacher, it's more maybe acute to me because of just dealing with things. But I think any person can see that all around us, in our nation, around the world, what sin has done. There's hardly even a free nation in the world that's because of sin. This nation is losing its freedom because of sin. We see the wreckage. We see the ruined lives. We see the washed out lives, washed away lives that are carried into eternal damnation because of building their life on sand with no foundation. All around us we see the wrecked ruins of sin. And I want to be specific. Broken homes. Fatherless children. Mothers who have become murderers. People who have become perverts. Forsaken wives. And forsaken husbands, blinded minds, broken hearts, broken bodies, our prisons overflowing, our courts clogged, wounded spirits and wounded hearts of the abused and the misused, who weeping parents who wonder what went wrong, cesspools and sewer lagoons of entertainment and media that have so filled the hearts and minds of our populace with poison as they drink in the filth of hell. Scorners and mockers fill our land. Fools who are heading our education systems and our news media systems. And they are labeled as stars. And yet the Bible says, I want you to listen. I want you to know why I don't want to be a star. 
In Jude, verse 13, the Bible said, They are raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. Just recently, Brad Pitt, who is from Springfield, Missouri, became a very famous Hollywood actor. His mother came out against same-sex marriage, and he basically blasphemed and dishonored his own mother, the national news media. He gave $100,000 in donation to same-sex marriage ballot issues in states in the last election. And I'm saying that this entertainment industry and this media industry and his life is built upon Sam and Brad Pitt's headed to hell. Sadly, I have to say that. Born and raised up here at Springfield and went to a church I could name. But he's headed to hell because life is built upon sand. News broadcasters and media who are mere puppets of hell. Propaganda puppets who have sold the truth for a crumb of liberal lime light. Political leaders who are violating their own oaths and violating the Constitution and betraying their own nations. Blown about with every wind of greedy, power-hungry, anti-biblical world philosophies. And then religious leaders who are nothing more than blind leaders of the blind. Leading people to the slaughter pen of hell through another gospel, which is not another gospel. And then down in our own personal lives, we see depression on a scale never imagined. Despair, suicide, surrender to sin and to Satan. Our people, our children, our families becoming slaves to drugs, drink, dope, antidepressants, insanity, witchcraft, and demonism. And when we survey all of this, we say to ourselves, is there any hope? Is there any hope? Is all the world just one big shifting sand? And let me say something to you. You go to church and you put faith in somebody and they mess up bad and you wonder what in the world is going wrong. One of the largest churches in Springfield just recently lost their pastor due to adultery. The First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana, the old famous church of Jack Hiles, his son-in-law was pastor up there and was just taken down through adultery. Churches losing pastors, homes breaking up. And you wonder, is all the world, is even our churches built on sand? Why aren't our churches standing? Is there really a rock upon which you can build your personal life? Is there a rock upon which you can honestly build your marriage? That you can build your home and your family upon? Is there honestly a rock that your children's lives can be built upon so that they don't get washed out? Is there a rock upon which the church can stand and not be blown around with every wind of doctrine and the floods of iniquity? Is there a rock upon which our nation can survive? And I declare to you this morning without hesitation or reservation, the rock still stands. All that's got to be done, you've got to get on it and then build on it. The rock has not moved. The same God that enabled Noah To build an ark to the saving of his house from the judgment of that flood is the same God who has given you and I the materials and the tools to build our lives upon the rock so that when the winds blow, the rains come, and the floods flow, our homes and our lives can stand. Let me tell you something. If I believe, Brother Phil, for one second... That this Bible, that what Jesus said was not true, I'd quit right now. I have no time for phony baloney business. If this faith and this Savior is not the rock upon which I can build my life, and it stand the trials and the troubles and the problems of life, then I'm out of here. But I want to tell you something through personal experience this morning. I have found Him to be the rock. I have found that every place that I have built on that rock, like he said, I've stood. When I've gotten off on the sands of my own ideas and the sands of sin, I fell. 
I'm telling you the rock stands. I'm telling you the rock works. And if you'll build your life upon the sayings of Jesus Christ, and you'll get off of the sands of your own ideas and you'll get out of the sands of your sin, let me tell you something. I'm about sick of all the garbage and the counseling stuff. 99% of the problems in people's lives is nothing less than sin. Sin! We want somehow or another to wiggle it around and redefine it and readjust it and meld it into some kind of a psychological, you know, intellectual exercise when all the time it is behind that garbage sin. And the older I get and the farther I go and the more experience I have with my own heart and the experience with the lives of others, the more I see it clearly. It is just sin. We don't have to be washed out. We don't have to be washed away. We do not have to be blown away by the winds of this world. And we can, as the Apostle Paul wrote, having done all to stand. I didn't have this in my message, but I'm going to say it. And I want you to listen to me carefully. I say this with fear and trembling. Apart from Zach being on the way home, he and Jamie's on the way back from Oregon. They would have been here if they possible. They, there was no way they could get here. But apart from him being gone this morning, all six of my children are in church. Except Susanna, they're all grown, and she's just about grown. They've got enough sin nature in them to poison all of America because they're from me. But I want to tell you something, and I say this to the glory of God. That little woman sitting over there that God gave me as a wife. We made a conscientious decision that we were going to try to build our lives and our family and our marriage and our everything upon the Bible. And that's 30 years ago. And I'll tell you what, a trucker drove in yesterday as we was working there and helping him get loaded and so forth. He, he said to me, he said, is that your daughter? And I said, yes. And he said, he said, I know that's your son. He said, he looks like you. He said, I assume that's another son. I said, yeah. And he said, and you're the dad. I can tell that. I said, you're too old. <laughs> and that old trucker from Ohio turned to me and said, do you know how blessed you are? Do you know how blessed you are to have your children, to be working with your children? I'm not saying you've got to work with your children to be blessed. I'm saying that if you just have a relationship with your children and your children aren't just off somewhere rejecting the faith and denying the faith that you're blessed. I didn't say that they're not sinners. They're sorry and low down and wicked as hell itself apart from the grace of God. And that's not just cheap preacher talk. That's the truth. And if they'll be honest with you, they'll tell you the same thing. But what I do say is this, that I thank God. And they may blow out tomorrow. But I'm going to tell you something. I believe, God, that if we'll build our lives on the rock, that we'll stand. I'm telling you this morning, you can build your life on the rock. That doesn't mean you're not going to mess up. But I'm telling you what about being on the rock. You can get back up and get going again. But if you're in sinking, whirling sand, it's pretty hard to get back up. You say, Reggie, how can we do it? Number one this morning, get on the rock. Get on the rock. Be sure, if you want to build your life on the rock, you want to build your personal life, your marriage, your home, your family, whatever it is, your business, you want to build it on the rock. First of all, you've got to be sure you're on the rock. I speak of your soul's salvation. Jesus Christ is that rock. Jesus Christ is that sure foundation. The Bible says, <coughs> no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, Jesus Christ. But you don't, <coughs> and listen to me, you and I don't and didn't build the rock. That's where a lot of folks get messed up. You don't build the rock. You get on the rock. And you build up from the rock. Christ is the rock. I'm talking about your salvation. <clears throat> the first time the word rock is mentioned in Scripture, the Bible said that God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 17, He said these words, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and, shall come wa- and there shall come water out of it. 
You know, if you know anything about the Bible at all, that that was a picture of Jesus Christ being smitten for our sins at Calvary and water of salvation and the water of life coming out of his wounds to save our souls. And whenever he told him that, that was a picture of Jesus Christ being slain, being crucified for your and I's sin. You say, Reggie, how do you get on the rock? You put your faith, you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and God will place you on the rock. But you can't build your own rock. It's a picture and a foreshadow. It pictures salvation by grace, and I want to take a little bit of time to say this. When he smote that rock with the rod, picturing the rod of God's wrath, Against the lawbreakers, the law, the law of God smiting with death, the penalty of sin, and water come out of that rock. It's a picture of grace. Let me tell you why. First of all, that water came out of that rock. It was the unworthy Israelites that didn't deserve that water at all. And you and I don't deserve salvation. God brought them the water even when they didn't, were unworthy and didn't deserve it. Salvation, un, we're unworthy of it. We're undeserving of it. But God gives us. That's what grace is. Number two, it was free. God didn't charge them for a bottle of water. Amen. Salvation's free this morning. You can't be good enough to work for it and to strive for it and go to church and get baptized and do all kinds of stuff. It's free. But not only is salvation free, it's abundant. There's plenty of water. And God can save you, amen. Number four, it was near to them. They didn't have to go across the desert after it. Salvation is near you. It's right, it's right there in front of you. God is right now speaking to your heart. Salvation is near. It's not a far off. And it was theirs for the taking. All you had to do is receive it. And I want to ask you this morning, have you received the water of salvation from Christ, our smitten rock? The next time you read about the rock in the Bible, it's five times in the book of Deuteronomy. We're speaking of the coming Messiah. The word rock is capitalized, speaking of a personage, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can read of the prophecy of the Messiah, the rock that has come. And then you read through the Bible, David and the prophets referring to uh, my rock. He's my rock and my fortress, my high tower. And David speaks often and frequently of the attributes of Christ as his rock. And then finally in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, they said they drank from that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them, talking about Exodus. And that rock was Christ. And so now we sing, rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow, listen to it, be of sin, the double cure make, wash, and make me pure. God, God just doesn't save you without making you pure. I'm telling you something. The blood, the blood to pay for your sin, the water to wash, the water of the Word. We also sing that old song, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And here today, let me tell you something. I want to give you something. I, I can't make you unsaved. I can't unsave you. But I would to God if it would discover, if you would discover for yourself if you're really not. Because if you're not building, if you're not on the rock, you can't build on the rock. And I warn each of us today and myself, do not build your life on the sands of religion. You ready? Don't build your life on the sands of religion. I'll tell you, this country is full of religion. But it's full of lost people. I was so blessed. Last night, Brother Mitchell, a trucker, he's taking 600 of our CDs to the West Coast this coming week. He lives down in Tennessee, and he's, he's quite a guy. He talked about a fireball witnessing machine. He is. And I said to him this. I said, Brother Mitchell, <coughs> I said, have you ever heard of Ray Comfort? He laughed. He said, have I heard of Ray Comfort? He said, I got his Bible in my truck that he writes to help you be a soul winner. And he said, he's got a Bible that's got a lot of questions that people might ask you to how to answer them. He said, let me tell you how I used it. And by the way, Houston is teaching this now back in the young adult Sunday school, how to win people to Christ using the biblical method. And I want you to be praying because I think, I'm still praying, but I think I'm going to take this whole church through this on Sunday morning during the preaching hour on the videos. It's so powerful. How many of you in here would at least like to know how to talk to a lost person biblically and intelligently, and you'd like some training of how to do that? Amen. Buddy, I'm going to tell you something. This is why. Let me give you something. This is like God was confirming. what Houston and I had a long talk this week. I watched all the videos. I'm praying about it. This trucker calls me last night, and I asked him. He said, Reggie, have I ever used that? Let me give you my latest one. 
He said, I pulled my truck into a cell phone load and somewhere, I forget where he's at, some, some big city somewhere. And he said, I got out of my truck and he said, I got unloaded and he said, I was waiting on the deal to get unloaded. And he said, I went down the street and said, I'm always looking for an antique shop or a little old, you know, them, the, a little place to buy stuff. He buys books and he buys antiques and stuff while he's on the road. He said, that's my saving retirement plan. And he said, I see this store that's got a Nippon dish in it and I kind of liked it. But he said, it said closed on the door. But he said, I seen somebody in there. But they had closed. He said, I knocked on the door because I wanted to buy that dish. And he said, the lady come up there and said, well, come in. He said, are you open? She said, sure, we're open. He said, well, your sign says closed. Well, she said, that must be why nobody's come in today. <laughs> and he says, well, what you doing, ma'am? She says, well, watch this now. She says, I'm reading my Bible. He says, you're reading your Bible. He said, I'm a Christian. He said, boy, that's great. And he said, we started talking about the Bible. And he said, uh, some customers then came in, said she flipped the sign around and said she went to help them. And he said, I looked down at the Bible she'd read, and I noticed it was a Bible that the Jehovah Witnesses use. And he said, generally speaking, Reggie, they ain't using that Bible unless they're Jehovah Witnesses or have been given them by the Jehovah Witnesses. So he said, when that customer left, he said, I asked her a little bit there. And he, said, he said, ma'am, you're a Jehovah Witness, ain't you? She said, well, how'd you know? He said, by the Bible you're reading. He said, ma'am, I want to ask you. She said, well, she said, would you pray for me? He said, well, how can I pray for you? She said, me and my sister has been at odds for six months about religion. We ain't getting along. And I'd like you to pray for me. He said, I, I, I'd like to be at peace with my sister. He said, ma'am, can I ask you a question? He said, if I was to steal that Nippon dish up there while you was in the back, he said, what would that make me? She said, you'd be a thief. He said, that's right. He said, ma'am, there's a woman come walking in here with not much on, and she's flashing herself around, and he, you said you saw me start drooling out the corners of my mouth and looking at her. He said, what would you think was going on in my mind? He, she said, you'd be committing adultery. He said, that's right. He said, and ma'am, if I told you that Jesus Christ was coming next Thursday at 6.32 p.m., and I came back next month and he hadn't come. What would you call me? She said, a false prophet. He said, can I tell you that the people you're following and studying after has made three prophecies of Jesus coming and they never didn't make it. She says, you're kidding. No, he said, you can study that and find for yourself. They've made three separate distinct prophecies of the second coming of Jesus Christ and had missed every one of them. And he said, you said that'd make me a false prophet. The man you're studying after is a false prophet. She said, I can't believe God sent you in here. I needed to hear that. (laughs) That's the technique that I'm showing you about using the law. See, if you set them up where it's because the conscience is down in here to tell you what's right or wrong, if you ain't never heard this Bible. And I'm saying this to you that we need to understand. You cannot build your life upon the sands of religion. That's what that woman was doing. He said, he said, he said, man, he said, where does your sister go to church? Said she goes to a Baptist church. He said, I'd recommend you get down there with your sister. (laughs) Hey, don't build your life on the sands of self-righteousness. You know what? You may homeschool or Christian school and you may have a dress down to your ankle and you may do everything right and not smoke and dope and you ain't never had a taste of liquor in your life. But oh, you're self-righteous. You're not really trusting Christ. You're continuously looking around about other people that don't live as good as you do and you're trusting in yourself. And you'll die and go to hell. You'll die and go to hell with your long dress on and your shortcut hair and your shirt buttoned up to your collar and doing everything and, and quitting your tobacco. You'll die and go to hell. Quitting tobacco doesn't send you to heaven. Don't build your life on the sands of self-righteousness. More people have gone to hell over self-righteousness than anything I know about. Don't build your life on the sands of education. Do you think you just know it all? You think you're, you're smarter than God. I watch an old brother, what's his name? Can't think of it now. Talk to an atheist. He said, you people running around believing God. He said, and all of you has got your own little flavor. He said, he said if you ever, in other words, get, you get smart, said you'll quit believing in God. And old Ray told him, he said, see that building? He said, yeah. He said, believe it had a builder? Oh, I know where you're going. Yeah? 
He said, you see the building? Do you believe it had a builder? Did it have a designer? Well, yeah. He said, how can you look at everything around you in creation and not know there's a creator? How can you look at your own body, your own eyes, your own hands, your own, your own being and not know? A... He said, how is it you can know that? Hey, there's a car over there. You reckon somebody designed it or just flop in place? I mean, really, folks, you know, that's why the Bible said professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Idiocy. Don't build your, by the way, not only don't build your life upon the sands of education, but don't build them on the sands of ignorance. Well, I just, I just hunt deer and fish. I don't read my Bible. I don't go to church. I ain't going to be a hypocrite like them folks up there at Norwood. You know, claim to know everything. Couldn't quote you three scriptures, passages of Scripture, word perfect, that they're going to hang if they didn't. Ignorance will not keep you out of hell. Don't, don't build your life on the sands of philosophy, the humanism, the deism, the evolution, and all that junk. And don't build your life upon the sands of wealth and possessions. Boy, that's dangerous. I have a propensity, you know. I mean, I have this deal. I want to make sure my family is provided for. I'm talking about well. I, mean, I don't know. It's just a, I guess it's a guy thing. Maybe. I don't know. What is it, Phil? It makes us want to have more than we need. I mean, I've got this deal in me, you know. If I die, I want to make sure Karen's taken care of. I want to make you know. And I don't really think there's anything wrong with that. But if my, if my life is built upon that, I mean, it, I mean, it'll crash. Because to everybody, the rains come, and to everybody, the floods come, and to everybody, the winds blow. But what, what, you say, Reggie, why does God allow the rains and the winds and the floods to come into our life? So you'll discover what foundation you're on. What happens? These three elements that God sends into your life discover what nobody else can really see. You see, your foundation is what I can't see. And He sends in the winds and the rains and the floods. So that your foundation will be discovered whether it is or not. And now, can I say to you, the trials that you're going through are blessings in disguise. Because all God's doing is... Now, wait a just a minute. I didn't say that you could... I, you can be on the rock most of your life. You can be saved and never build on it. You follow me? You can be saved, but if you don't go back to the sayings of Jesus Christ and put them into practice, you're not building on the rock. And then you wonder what's wrong. What does it mean to get on the rock? It means to agree with God that you're a sinner. It means to agree with God that you can't save yourself, that you're a hell-deserving, wicked, God-law-violating sinner. It means that you renounce any other method of salvation or any other means of salvation, that you come to Christ alone, that you repent toward God and turn and forsake the world, the flesh, and the devil, and and your sin with a godly sorrow, not because you got caught, but because you sinned against a holy God. Not sorry that you're discovered, but sorry that you sinned against the Creator God that loves you. That you personally, you personally place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that you trust in His substitutionary, sacrificial death on the cross in your place for your sin. His burial and His resurrection. That you believe on Him and Him alone. I want to tell you something this morning. Sorry as I am, I hang my eternal soul on one thing. That's the death, bone, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for me in my place. That's it. My preaching doesn't count for anything. Zero. Now, will there be rewards for Christians? Sure. That's not your salvation. Salvation is not a reward. It's a free gift. Rewards are earned through service. Salvation is given by sacrifice. Now, you say, how can I here build upon this rock? Two requirements. God says hear and then do. James says, don't be just be hearers of the word, but doers also deceiving your own selves. We are not now talking about salvation when we start building on the rock. We're talking about growing in the Lord and building our life and a family so it won't be blown away by this world. We're talking about a building a life that doesn't get wiped out and washed away when the storms come. And so what I want you to do real quickly with me and try to do this fast, just flip back a couple pages to chapter 5. <clears throat> because we're talking here about hearing what Jesus, Jesus said, if you hear and do my sayings. By the way, did you ever notice the Sermon on the Mount, it says, you have heard, but I say unto you. You have heard, but I say unto you. That's what you don't pay attention to. But let's look at it in chapter 5, verse number 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. God says, if you want to build your life on a rock, be humble. Don't be cocky. Don't be proud. Doesn't that fit Scripture? 
God says that proud people, he'll, he'll bring them down. He'll abase them. Humble, he'll lift them up. Poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. God says you ought to have, listen, you ought to have a repentant spirit and a mourning attitude over sin. Look at, blessed are the meek. Meek means yielded rights. It's the opposite of being angry all the time. You don't get mad because you've given your rights to God. You don't have a right for your socks to be in your drawer every time. You don't have a right for somebody to let you get in the line of traffic. And you quit being angry. <clears throat> Anger tears lives down. It's building your life on sand. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. You want to, let me tell you what, you want to be righteous. You just don't want to know the Bible. You just don't want to have intellectual ascent about Scripture. You hunger for living right. You don't want, you want to live, you don't want to watch porn. You don't want to drink, drink. You want to live righteous. You don't, you want to, you want to do honest. You want to tell people the truth when you sell them something. You want to tell that guy the truth when you trade your vehicle in. You want to live righteous. Inside. God says that's when you're, that's when you're building on rock. Let me tell you something. When your conscience is clear, winds can blow, all kinds of garbage can happen. But if you're right before God, it doesn't even matter what the people think. Then it says, blessed are the merciful. Learn how to forgive people. You can't build your life on a rock if you don't learn how to forgive people. You get torn up, your mind will be shredded to pieces. I mean tormented. Now what Jesus said, he'll turn you over to tormentors. You've got to learn to forgive people and yourself. And then he says, pure in heart. Don't let garbage be in your heart. Let it be pure. Don't be double-hearted. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's a soul winner. God says, you want to what? You want to build your life on a rock? Can I say something to you? You know what? We're, I, I, I'm preaching this morning. I think God's talking to me while I'm preaching. We are going to go through this course. You know why? Because I believe most people in life that have been saved are stale because they're never involved in helping anybody else come to Jesus Christ. And one of the things that will help you more than anything in the world to get excited about serving God is talking to other people. You know what? Some of you, some of you today have got little bitty gnats flying around your eyes, and I know I hate them too. They bother the soup out of me. But did you know something? When you're fighting a fire, you forget about gnats. Did you know if you was in a boat and you was flipping gnats like that and your three-year-old fellow with the boat, you ain't going to worry about gnats no more. You're worried about getting your three-year-old out of the water. Peacemakers, blessed are they was persecuted. Best thing will happen to you, get some good old-fashioned persecution on you. Somebody call you a hypocrite, somebody run you down, somebody just, you know, somebody talk to you about your faith, and I mean persecute you. I mean good for you. Yeah. Amen. Then you wrote, verse number 12, rejoice and be exceeding glad when everybody lies on you, tells stories on you and all that kind of stuff, if it's not the truth. Because God says you've got a great reward in heaven. Then verse number 13, be salt and be light. And he said, verse number 16, he said, let your light so shine before men. God says you want to build your life upon the rock. Look at verse number 17 through 20. He says, listen, I didn't come to destroy the law. He said, I came to fulfill it. And he said, if you talk, go around telling people not to, not to abide by the law, you're crazy in bed, but you're going to have some problems when you meet God. I'm going to tell you something. The law of God's good. Now, it don't save you, but it's good. It's holy. It'll drive you to Christ because you can't keep it. Amen. Amen. But I can I tell you something? If you go back in the, when he's talking about the law, he's talking about Moses, Deut- uh, Genesis, Deut- Deuteronomy. You know what? When it says over there that you ought not, uh, that, that, that you ought to not do this and do that, you know what that's good for you? It ain't bad for you. It's good. When God says man shall not lie with mankind, that's a, that's a good law. Amen. When God tells you about how to deal when you, you, you go borrow something and you're injured or you hurt it and you ought to, you ought to make restitution and you ought to do right by your neighbor, that's a good law. And Jesus never did away with all that. And he says, go back and stay that. Learn how to live. That's what our country got away from. Man, lie, that, that Old Testament law used to be embedded into our civil law and our criminal law. And we used to have a wonderful country because of it. And he says, and that's how our nation was built on the rock. Well, you get into verse number 21. He gets talking about hating people. He said, uh, he said you're talking about killing, but he said, I'm telling you something. You're angry with your brother without a cause. He said, you're in danger of judgment. He, just, he, he goes on down and talks about being reconciled to people. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. People's taking antidepressants and they're all messed up because they're mad at people who don't know how to reconcile, don't know how to get right with people, and they're cr- going crazy. And God says, hey, listen, you've got a problem. You used to come to church. You've got a problem there. Go get it fixed. Yeah. If you can. Uh, look at down verse 27. You have heard that it was said to them old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. He talks about the whole thing right. He said adultery is so bad you'd be better off what do you take for an eye? How many, how many would sell an eye this morning? Chris Roy, I don't see him here, but Chris has got an eye out. 
He was hit with a BB gun, wasn't it, Jim, when he was a boy? And it got his eye. He's got a glass eye. He'll freak you out, man. You take that eye out, he'll throw it at you. You, you know, no. <laughs> no, but I'm saying this to you. What do you think Chris would take for that eye? What would you take for an eye? Sid, what do you take for your left eye? $1,000? A little more than that? How about 20000 You say you left eye for 20000 <clears throat> <laughs> You're the first boy I ever heard to sell you over 20,000. <laughs> Can you have a talk with him, Amy? I shouldn't have done that to you. No, kid. But man, what would take your eye? You know what Jesus said? He said, You're better off to take your eye and pluck it out than to get messed around with adultery. That's pretty serious. By the way, adultery, wash your home out, wash your family out, wash your marriage out, right? You just continue on down through there. He go down to verse number 31 talk about divorce. I want to tell you something. Listen, I've said from the start, this is a rebuilding church. If you've been divorced, remarried, I'm going to tell you, get it in the blood and let's go. Amen. All right? Let's rebuild. Don't sit around the rest of your life, be mad and bitter to everybody else. Let's just rebuild and let's go on down the road. But I'm going to say this to you. Divorces are never done. Never, ever done. Never, ever done. Oh, you can block off all the consequences you want to, but it's never, ever done. And God loves you. God doesn't want you to divorce because he's trying to make your life miserable. He wants you to stick it out because he wants to save you from a lot of trouble and your children and grandchildren from a lot of trouble. He's talking about building life on a rock. And we could just jump, uh, go down to verse number 39. We preached on that about the cheek, turning the cheek and your coat and going two miles with those that can pay and so forth. About loving your enemies. I'm telling you something. It's the truth. Blessing those people. You want to, how do you get rid of a snake bite? Antidote. And the, the, the antidote for the poison of hatred and enmity is love and prayer. It is hard to hate people you're praying for and love. If that makes sense. Uh, go to number six and he starts teaching you how to give. A lot of people are giving all over the country. How much money was given for the campaign? But he tells you how to give, what to give, how to give. And so it amounts to something. He tells you how to pray. He tells you how to fast. He tells you, run on down through there. He tells you in verse number 19, look at verse number 19. Lay up your treasures in, uh, on earth. I'm telling you, talking about building your life so you don't get blown away. Let me tell you something. If you're building your life on your possession stuff and that gets blown away, that's when people have big, big trouble. When their whole trust is in what they own. Uh, <clears throat> there, there's so many things. Can't serve two masters. Verse 24. Verse 25, how not to be worried about stuff. God doesn't want you worrying. He doesn't want you going crazy. And it just goes on and on. And I'm just telling you this. I'm going to quit. But I'm saying this to you. If you'll read and do his sayings, you are building your life up on the rock. And what I'm telling you is people are hearing it, but they ain't doing it. And I'm guilty. Now, I want to go to these three things we get out of here. I'm hot. I don't know if you're hot. <clears throat> Brother Don, how's your sciatic nerve? You need prayer. I got one of those things too, and that's why I'm glad I'm a preacher. If I had to sit on my sciatic nerve, it'd drive me crazy. If I was, if I was, wasn't preaching, I'd be standing back here against the wall or sitting on a high stool with a heavy pad to it. So I do have compassion on you. Old preacher told me here a while back, and I read you, the bottom can't endure more than the, the brain can't take in more than the bottom can endure. So you, you know. <clears throat> there's three things Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven. There he said that it's going to come to you. Now you listen to me. There is not a person in this building or that will ever listen to this message, but what this coming to you. Number one, rains coming to you. I'm going to try your foundation. The rains speak of, you get this, the rains speak of common things. Things are common to everybody. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, I believe, or 6, it rains on the just and the unjust. We're talking about things here that will happen to your life that happens to everybody whether you're saved or lost. Can I tell you a little secret? People die whether they're saved or lost. People lose spouses and husbands and children and family members, whether they're saved or lost. You, you, you being a Christian don't mean your family ain't going to die. And there's things that happen to everybody. Sorrow comes to everybody, folks. Problems come to everybody. Sickness comes to everybody, whether you're saved or not. You can be living right with God all you want to, and you still could get sick. I don't care what them TV preachers tell you. By the way, I ain't never seen them go visit the sick. They're not worried about visiting the sick. They're just trying to pull the money out of you. Anyway, I'll get off, I'll get off that. But lost. Everybody suffers loss. How many of you have ever suffered some loss? Yeah, it's common, ain't it? Rains. 
How about tragedy is in life? I mean, so, hey, hey, why did this happen? Hey, it's rain. It's coming rain. It's coming rain. Listen, listen. Things happen to you that happens to people all over the world. And way worse than you've had. Financial loss, enmity, discouragement, all these things. They're common things, and you need to understand that. They're the rains. But if you can't take the common things, the rain, how are you going to stand the, the floods? How are you going to stand the winds when they come? That's why God says, all right, let's get on the rock. Because the rains will come. Second thing, let me just say this. If you're on the rock and here and do it, baby, you won't be wiped out washed away. You know why? Because you will remember things like this, that he never will leave you and forsake you. You remember that he told you not to lay your treasures up on heaven, but uh, on earth, but up in heaven. He'll, remember, he'll told you to set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. He told you that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. I'm telling you something. You remember. You remember that it's not just here. It's over there that counts. And so what I'm saying is when those rains come in your life, if you're on the rock and you've observed his sayings and you're doing them, you'll stand. It will wash you out. The floods. Now, floods are a different deal. You know, rains come. I ain't never been to a big flood. Some of you guys have been around with this flood. I'm telling you, this flood business can, it can fix things. It can wash things away. Isaiah 59, 19 says, When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against you. What stops floods? A standard. Levies. All right? God says, listen to this. Now, you believe this. God says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against it. And that's what God wants to do in this church, in your family. In your home, in your life. The Spirit of the Lord is lifting up a standard. What is that standard? The standard of Scripture, the sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ. David said in Psalms 18, 4, The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Do you listen to me? Some of you have a spirit of fear on you because you see this flood of iniquity coming across the United States and it's like, I'm in a lot of what our kids are going to do. David said, I was afraid. That's normal. You can do that, but you need to overcome that fear with the truth of God's Word. Flood, what, listen to me carefully. Floods represent the rising and encroaching sin, evil, wickedness, and vileness that just is engulfing and overflowing people, families, and nation. Let me give you an illustration right now. In the Internet, the pornography thing, it, it is just wiping men out like a wave. It's just, it's just wiping men out. It is wiping preachers out. It's like a flood coming to our nation. It is just literally flooding and washing families away. Liquor has done that for generations in America. That flood of liquor comes in and it just kills families and kills homes and kills marriages and just destroys young people. The drug culture came in America like a flood and it just looked. How many people do you know lives have been ruined by drugs? Before God sent a physical flood, there was a flood of iniquity in the earth. And it overflowed the homes and hearts and minds of humanity and so it is today. The flood of sin through TV, movies, music, art, internet, fashions, fads, schools, the government even, is promoting and is pushing a flood of iniquity. Let me tell you something. When you start rewarding women for leaving their husbands, and you start telling women, don't get married or you'll lose your benefits, so just let him live with you. You're promoting flood of iniquity. Our, our government is one of the biggest promoters of flood of iniquity I know of. Our churches are promoting iniquity. Let me tell you something. When, there, when you can watch ads on TV of churches up here in Springfield, the church ad, and they've got young people dancing down below the stage area, and they've got smoke and, and lights and everything going on and off and stuff, and they look like they're at a rock concert at big churches up here in Springfield. They are literally bringing in a flood of iniquity to those young people. They just well call it the first church of the fornicators. I can tell what they just well call it. It's a flood of immorality, adultery, fornication. And now we have incest flooding. And I want to say clearly from this pulpit, there better be no incest in this church. I will tell you something. This is honest truth. And you can say, I'll whoop you. Maybe you can. But you might not be able to whip nine other guys with me. I, if, if I could, and I knew you had abused your children like that, I think about ten men ought to get you and tie you to a tree and horsewhip you. That's what I really believe. There's nothing more sorrier and low down than for you to take advantage of some little child. Your daughters and your sons ought to feel absolutely 300% safe in your home. But it's, it's, it's flooding our land. 
constant news stories every day. Go to camp. Fully incest in this country, isn't it, man? Kids absolutely are being destroyed because of incest. Uncles and aunts and all kinds of nonsense and stupidity and craziness and fathers. Nakedness, violence, sodomy, abortion, murder, violence, false religions, hatred, deceit, lying, drugs, idolatry, God-haters, pornographers, and liquor. And I'm telling you this morning, if you and yours are not on the rock and built upon the rock, you're going to get washed out with it because there's a flood coming through this land. If you're not on the rock, you won't stand. And that's why I want to challenge you today. The challenge is get back to his sayings, hear them, do them, take action. Don't just say, well, that's a nice message. You know what? I'm I'm about sick of, oh, that's a good message, Reggie. I really just, it don't do me no good. It does not spark me up. It doesn't excite me. It just makes me almost think, well, am I just entertaining? Am I just giving giving their spiritual fix for Sunday? Or are they going to do anything with the message? How serious have you taken Christ's commandments? We listen to everything else and everybody else, but we don't know much about his commandments. In one of the videos I watched this week, they were interviewing about four teenage boys in a, in a mall. And this is the question they asked the boys. Can you name the Ten Commandments? I'm not sure, Houston, whether I'm right or not, but I, I know if they got any, they just got one commandment. Those four boys put their minds together and could not come up with over one of the Ten Commandments. And we wonder why a flood of iniquity. Then here's what blew me away. They said, we'll give you, I forget how many seconds it was, to name us ten beer companies. And man, and, li- and they beat the clock. And named ten types of beer and beat the clock. Our children can name ten beer companies, but cannot name one or two of the commandments. I've seen person after person in my years of preaching, marriage after marriage, family after family washed away. By the flood of iniquity. The Bible said great was the fall of it. And the ruined lives and the ravaged lives. Something that's always made me mad about men leaving their wife. Is that they leave their children like little lambs along the side of the road. For the buzzards to come. I don't know about you men. But it, something, something rises up inside me when I ever think about some other man or somebody. My daughter being where somebody could. You know, and that ought to be something raised up in you. And if you don't have any other reason to stick it out with your spouse, just think for your kids. Like dead men walking in a fantasy world to the day of judgment. And the jaws of hell open, they fall in, and they don't even realize they were on sand the entire time. The last thing Jesus mentioned was winds. And this is serious. (coughs) Winds. Blue, it says, and beat upon it. It speaks of spiritual warfare. Jesus told John, or told Nicodemus, the wind, talking about the spirit bloweth whither it listeth. When you read about wind in Scripture, you're talking about spiritual, about the spirit. And not just the Holy Spirit, but a false spirit. And let me tell you where your biggest battle is many years after you're saved. It's a spiritual battle that you can't hardly describe. It's the wind. You can't see where it's coming from. You don't understand how the power of it, but it's there. And you could have been saved for a long time and you find yourself battling thoughts and attitudes and things in your mind that you think, how could I be saved 25 or 30 years and have these kind of stupid attitudes and stupid thoughts? The Bible said we're not to be carried about with every wind of doctrine. It speaks of the spiritual attacks and the assaults from hell, the the demonic powers unleashed on you. They'll produce lying. They'll produce sowing of doubt, sowing of discord. They'll produce discouragement. They'll tempt you to walk by sight and not by faith. They'll taunt you with circumstances instead of taking and take your eyes off the Savior. Job experienced all three, the rain, the floods, and the winds. But Job was built on the rock. And I want you to listen to what Job said after all that was thrown at him. With ten children dead, his wealth and assets stolen and burned. His wife telling him to curse God and die. This is what Job said. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job further got down the road and he said this. Yea, though he slay me, 
yet will I serve him. And finally, in Job 19, Job said these words, I know my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms shall destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see myself and not another. He believed God, irregardless of the circumstances and the spiritual wickedness that was coming in his mind. Now, I want to tell you all something this morning that's not fun for me to tell you. But I'm going to tell you because you need it and it will help you. In the last few years, Brother Randy, I've experienced spiritual warfare. It wasn't like the first 20 years. The first 20 years, it was more identifiable. The last 10 years, it's been more unidentifiable, like a wind. And you think, where in the world can these stupid thoughts come from? And how, what, what, what's, what's wrong? And it's like, and watch the Bible. The fiery darts of the wicked. And I mean, you, your, your mind can get confused and bewildered, and all of a sudden you wonder, is the Bible even true? Is God real? Am I saved? Does it work? Am I just preaching some little goody goody two shoes bunch of junk? Does it help anybody? What about myself? Brother Dean, what happens when Reg Kelly, the preacher, has lustful thoughts? What happens when I'm thinking things that should be, you, know, you just can't believe you're even thinking? What happens when I have thoughts? If I had a chance, I'd, I'd put him out. Woo! I'm talking about winds that have come. That will so blow on your life that pretty soon there's not a person in this building that you even like. You're mad at everybody. There is nobody tells the truth. There's nobody really loves. There's nobody that really cares. They're only out of you what, the, what you can get out of you. The preacher's just in it for his job. He just gets a kick out of getting up there and blabbing his mouth. And pretty soon you're just bombarded with all kinds of junk, and then the devil sends these people, and then he starts, then he, after he's got you, what's this? After he's got you doing all these stupid, unbiblical, unholy, idiotic, crazy stuff out of hell, then he turns around and blackmails you. Said, see, that's proof that there's nothing to your profession. If you were saved, and of what you know, how could you ever think such thoughts? Hmm. Oh, but if you're on the rock and you're hearing and doing his sayings, there'll be a power come through, folks. And you may be bouncing up and down a little bit pretty soon. You, oh, my feet hit the rock. <laughs> How many's ever been in a creek swimming hole and you got the sweet creek swimming hole and you got in trouble and you started down and you thought, uh-oh, and all of a sudden you felt your feet hit the bottom. Boy, that's a good feeling. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. I just want to encourage you. You say, Reggie, what should I do with this message? You go home. You get this book out. You get Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And you dig deep. And you study it. And you say, you know what? I'm going to build my life on the rock. And I'm going to start doing what God says there. And that's the way we're going to live. And I ain't going to be mean about it. But I'm going to be gracious about it. But I'm going to be serious about it. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you do that... It'll protect you and save you from the storms of this life and the storm of judgment. Let's stand. I want to thank you for listening to me, but I wish you, I hope you'll thank God for letting Him talk to you. And I want to encourage you today to build your lives, your homes, your marriages, your family upon the rock. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't care whether you're single, married, divorced, got all kinds of trouble. You can make up your mind that you're going to be on the rock, irregardless of what anybody else is doing. And that's what you've got to do eventually anyway.